Welcome. This is the Cisco CCNA ENSA, also known as the Enterprise Networking Security and Automation Course. This course focuses on the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is course 3 of 3. Module 12 is all about network troubleshooting. In this module, we're going to be looking at documentation, troubleshooting with the process and tools, symptoms and ca cause, and we're going to wrap it up with uh, troubleshooting connectivity. When we're talking our Cisco courses, realistically, this is something that is kind of talked about here and there, but this is a critical skill for a network engineer, network technician, anyone dealing directly with the end user and connectivity to understand. The networking not performing affects everyone. The first part of that is going to be troubleshooting. Part of the troubleshooting aspect is understanding the flow of that communication, and we do that through network documentation. What does the network look like? What does it look like conceptually? What does it look like on a, uh, a layout? What are the topologies, both physical and logical? Is there a structure? Is it well documented? What's funny is accurate and complete documentation is called for. How oft, uh, however, oftentimes this isn't the case. Most network organizations that I've worked with or in most either network engineers or third party IT companies or even corporations that I've worked for, this is all we strived for, yet we fall short by a lot. Having current up-to-date information Having a network diagram that was looked at in the last year oftentimes is not feasible. It just it doesn't happen. And that's not to say in all situations, but in most situations, this is an area that we lack. Documentation should at least have uh, device information, age of equipment, things like that. There should be a performance baseline as well. If we understand how the network normally behaves and we start seeing abnormal behavior, we can adjust assuming that we actually understand what the network was supposed to act like in the first place. All network documentation should be kept in a single location together. That includes configuration backups. That is one that I will say has saved my butt many times, yet many organizations still don't do it or just don't have a current backup of their configuration. We did a cable changeover for a Cisco firewall once, and by changing out the GPIC in it, it actually wiped the configuration of a production firewall. We were changing out a SPF connector that was tied to a network segment that wasn't operational. We unplugged it, and when we unplugged it, it was hot swappable. It, for whatever reason, caused the core firewall to restart in the middle of the day. When it restarted, it lost its configuration. Luckily, we had at least a partial backup of the configuration, so we were only down for about 45 minutes. However, that was 45 minutes way too long, first of all. Second of all, we had to spend hours rebuilding the portion of the configuration that we didn't have. Backup documentation is by far one of the most crucial things you need to have, and that's one of those areas that we just suck at doing. All right, so let's look at what documentation should look like. That could be physical and logical topologies. That could be a physical topology outlining the connections, the interfaces, the wiring types, things like that, where the logical is going to be more of the configuration, the addresses, the VLANs, the Ether channels. You may also bring in things like STP, depending on how large of a switch environment you have. With this, 
you normally have multiple layers or multiple pages of the documentation. And again, it should be current. Device information should be able to give you what device it is, where it is, its location, its licensing, the year purchased. If it's a switch, uh, again, descriptions on the ports. Are they VLANs? Are they trunks? Are there some form of ether channel, uh, PAG P or LAC? What's the uh, native VLAN? Are there uh, 802.x or 802x uh, security? Is there switch port security? Are there servers attached to them? Are there addresses that are known? Maybe services, maybe MAC addresses. All of that should be there. But again, on all of this, one thing that is not listed that is crucial is its life. When was it purchased? Was it purchased new? When is the expected retirement date of the device? I say those are important because oftentimes in larger organizations where asset management on infrastructure wasn't always the best, I have found equipment that was in production for 10 years that in reality was supposed to be retired five years previous, but no one knew when it was purchased, so they just kept smoking it along. They had a five-year recycle period, and they knew they were going to be changing out equipment every so many years, but for whatever reason, certain infrastructure pieces lacked that information, so they just kept them longer than they should have. Eventually, it failed, because it, again, it was 10 years old, and when it failed, there wasn't a plan for replacement, because they weren't expecting it, even though it was aged or it should have been aged out of the network, but because of bad documentation, it wasn't. So oftentimes I get asked, well, why is this portion important? Like, why care about things like when it was purchased, or when it is expected to retire, or what type of devices are connected to a uh, appliance or a router or a switch? Part of this really goes to understand what's supposed to be there. If you have documentation that your, shows your switch has ports 1 through 8 populated, but 9 through 24 not populated, and you walk by and you see something populated in port 20, well, that's a red flag. That's something. You understanding that, hey, this switch only has 8 ports, but it's okay because the remaining ports are turned off. Part of that goes back to the documentation. After we understand the documentation, we have to understand the baseline. What does the network look like when it's normally running? What does it look like before congestion, before issues? That way we can take what a normal running network looks like and then compare it to a situation that would be something that is abnormal. If we see an uptick in certain types of traffic, if we know that is normal for that day at that time, then okay. But if we know that on Mondays, this is what traffic is supposed to look like, and we start seeing abnormal traffic, that's a red flag. So how do we do this? How do we do the network documentation? How do we get started? Step one, you have to figure out what type of data to collect. There are too many data points to select, so data could be overwhelming. So when you're doing your baseline, you need to understand what a good starting variable would look like. Maybe understanding the, the range of memory or resource utilization. Maybe understanding how many packets per second might be happening in general. You, again, you don't want to be too nitty gritty because some of this may change depending on operation, things like that. So try to be more selective when you are selecting the data points for your baseline. So after you identify what you should be collecting, step two is identify the devices and ports of interest. 
what are going to be the, the key ports that need to be monitored? Typically, you're going to be looking at edge or designated uh, or root ports. Anything that has a specific designation, you may want to take note of. If you're doing ether channel, if you're doing trunks, if you're doing a uh, three-tiered network design within a switch environment, distribution, uh, connections, access connections, core connections, you may want to select specific ports to determine which ones you're going to be looking at. Ports that are connected to servers, servers themselves, those are all things that should be of interest. All right, so once you've identified things of interest, step three would be determining the baseline duration. Are we capturing it for an hour? Are we capturing baseline data per day, per quarter? What? Maybe, uh, how often should we review this? Maybe you do a annual analysis and you update your baseline based off of an annual review. Part of that's all going to be depending on your organization. Normally, when you're capturing data for analysis, it should be a few days. It shouldn't be too long. You shouldn't be spending weeks doing this. But you do want to capture enough so that you have a clear understanding of what your network baseline should be. Once we get done with that, data measurement. And in reality, this is what they just show uh, our show commands. Show port, show VLAN, show ARP show IP route, show interfaces, show interface brief. All of these give us details for collecting data. So now let's talk about the troubleshooting process, the, the structure. Cisco likes this three-stage approach. Gather symptoms, isolate the problem, implement corrective action. If the problem is fixed, yes or no, if yes, document. If no, repeat. There are a seven step troubleshooting process also, which is define the problem. And that's not your definition. That is what is the end user reporting or what is the situation going on that would identify or define the problem. After that, gather information. See target what's being affected, uh, hosts, devices, uh, a specific segment, uh, what exactly is going on. From there, we should be able to propose a hypothesis. Try to figure out what's going on. That may include analyzing information and then proposing the hypothesis. The combination of analyze information and propose the hypothesis, they may go round robin for a little bit. They may go back to gather information and then update proposed hypothesis back and forth. After that, you should be able to eliminate possible causes. Once you've eliminated possible causes, you should be able to test your hypothesis. After testing a hypothesis, you should eliminate further possible causes. For example, if your hypothesis is the network is down because the person's Ethernet cable is unplugged, well, eliminate some of those possible causes by checking. Yes, that would be testing the hypothesis, but I mean, there, there can be some pre-elimination before testing and then some post-testing after. After you have eliminated possible causes, again, you may actually go through the proposed uh, hypothesis, update hypothesis portion again, and then if that does solve the problem, then you can navigate to the solve problem and document solution portion. So there is a structure to the troubleshooting process. All right, so defining the problem, how did we do that? Well, we do that by asking questions. You question the injury. You try to figure out what their issue is. Uh, things like what doesn't work exactly. Can you show me the issue? That will help you to 
determine the scope of the problem. Is it just this user? Is it multiple users? One of my favorite is I get a help desk ticket. Internet doesn't work. Network's down. I go there and I start asking questions. Well, how do, how do you know the network is down? Can you show me? And oftentimes, the user has deleted their web browser. That's all. The internet's not down. It's just the end user deleted their web browser. So, some user training, and we're able to fix that issue. If the network really is down, then I do some basic troubleshooting. Can I ping my gateway? Can I ping a domain name? Can I ping an IP address internal and external to the network? And from there, I escalate my troubleshooting steps. You try to determine if a problem is only occurring after changes were made. What has changed since when it was working to when it wasn't working? Use questions to eliminate what possible problems there may be. So remember, it's a process. It's not a all-in-one type step. Part of that is also gathering information using ping, traceroute, show commands, things like that. Remember that we have the OSI seven layers so that we can use the layers for troubleshooting. If we don't have some connectivity issues, maybe it's layer one, the wiring. Ignore the hub. I don't know why they put a hub on this photo, but whatever. Layer one could be the physical media. Layer two could be switching. Are we getting local communication? Are we getting to our default gateway? If we are, then we can go up the layer to the layer three and four. If we are able to get to our default gateway, can we get to an external resource? Can we get to an external IP or an external domain name? If we can do an IP but not a domain name, right there that tells you it's a DNS issue. If we're able to get to uh, neither of them, then we again, we escalate it. This is typically called bottom-up troubleshooting. We start with the physical and we go up the network. You can also do top-down and that's where you look at the end device and then you work down through the layers. 7, 6, and 5 are the end uh, device, then the router, then the switch, then the physical media. You can also divide and conquer. You start in the middle with basically testing routing. You could follow the path, and that's going to be the actual path, the source to the destination for troubleshooting. You can do substitution. You swap out cables or educated guesses. Again, when we are looking at the methodology for troubleshooting, the big thing is figure out what you're trying to solve. Come up with a plan, test, execute, repeat if necessary. At the very end, we document. So let's look at the troubleshooting process. If you have a baseline set of tools, normally that helps. If you have a knowledge base of what tickets have been done in the past, that also helps. If you have a network management system tool that might be able to be used to investigate an overall view of the network, again, beneficial. The knowledge base tool, if we know that this user keeps submitting a ticket for this issue, then that can be used for troubleshooting. We also have a protocol or packet analyzers like Wireshark, so we can see the flow of data throughout the network. Other tools could be like a multimeter, a cable tester, a cable analyzer, a certifier, other uh, network analyzers for detecting VLANs. What's really funny is most of this we have as fluke tools, but they can give us detailed readouts of the network, but they are expensive. We could also use the Cisco Prime NAM, which is a browser-based interface, and they can display a performance of the end devices. We could have logs as a troubleshooting tool. If we have our eight levels of logs, we can see what's going on. Normally, we would be centralizing our equipment 
to go to a dedicated log server so that we could analyze what's happening, but oftentimes organizations don't do this as well either. They know that we need to, but it's a process to do so. Instead, it's just not done. Next major section is symptoms and causes for the network issues. Performance uh, lower than the baseline. It could be, when was the baseline performed? Did we add new devices? Are we adding new traffic? When was the last time we measured the baseline? If we're getting connectivity issues, are there faulty wiring? Is there faulty equipment? Higher CPU utilization. Is the equipment overheated? Is the equipment overloaded? Is the operating temperature of the equipment too high? Are there any error messages coming from the devices where we have physical connections? Could it be power related? Are we getting hardware faults? Are we getting attenuation fault? Are we getting some type of message that says, hey, this cable or this port is going bad? Was the network designed properly? Are we exceeding the design limits? Are we exceeding the physical media limits? We actually had an, an access point installed uh, 150 meters away from our primary switch. It worked for number of years. However, recently it stopped working and traffic kept dropping and we couldn't figure out why. We did a, a cable map on it. We seen the length of the run and then we're like, oh, this cable's too long. We, we, we can't do that. The previous IT company said that it could go 200 meters or 300 meters and that was fine. But in reality, understanding the capabilities of our infrastructure matters. Are we getting excessive broadcasts or collisions on our network? Is our functionality of our switches, is it poor? Are our switches switches or are they hubs? That's a, a fun one. Are we having data link issues? Is there an encapsulation issue? Is our layer two technology ethernet or is it MPLS? Is there a conversion process? Is there a framing process? Is there a switching loop? Is there a switching problem? When we're talking layer three, the network troubleshooting layer, is there a IP addressing issue? Is there a routing issue? Is there a performance issue? Is the router able to process that many packets per second? I've had that happen a lot. I had a non-Cisco device. When you try to run over a 200 megabit connection, the CPU would overload and you wouldn't get your speed. If you had a different brand device, even if it was cheaper, that was made to handle the packets per second, it could handle the faster speeds. So again, performance is, is, is a factor. Processing load is a factor. Are there connectivity issues? Is there a routing table issue? Was this working prior to any changes? Is it a neighbor issue? Is it a adjacency issue? Was your router update or was your routing table updated because of a change? If we're talking layer four, is there a port issue? Is there a source to destination issue? Is there a, a filtering issue? Is there a weird wildcard issue? Is there an ACL issue? Is there a service issue like DNS or DHCP? Are these protocols functioning? Or is it a higher level protocol like HTTP or FTP or POP or SMTP? Is it a network issue or is it a network service issue? That allows us to troubleshoot based off of specific layers. Moving, uh, la or moving on is our troubleshooting IP connectivity. When we're looking at troubleshooting, again, we follow the general guidelines. I gave the example earlier about a uh, 
basic connectivity? Are we checking the physical connection? Are we checking that the cable's good? We're replacing the cable possibly. Are we making sure there's no ACLs that are blocking it? Or if we're able to get to our gateway or internal or external addresses, is it a DNS issue? And we go through that process. It is important to think through the layers. I normally go bottom up, physical. I make sure I'm connected to the switch and, and I work up that process. When we're looking at our troubleshooting, things like end-to-end -end connectivity is important. And we do that, again, by verifying the physical layer. If you have access to the equipment, a show interface, you want to look for interface uh, status, input-output errors, or drops. You want to check for duplex mismatch. Again, it's highly unlikely that a connection that was working will do a duplex mismatch, but something that you want to look at just in case. You want to look at the addressing, uh, a, an ARP table, if nothing else. Make sure your IP address and your physical MAC address are functional. Make sure that you're connected to the right VLAN. Make sure that you have basic connectivity. You can do that by pinging the gateway, show IP route, or pinging the gateway. If you have an IPv6 address, again, you'll be looking for the IPv6 default gateway, pinging the default gateway of the IPv6 uh, address, and again, verifying basic connectivity. All of this will lead us to verifying the correct path. You ping the gateway, if you don't get connectivity, you know there is a layer two issue. If uh, you have an address, and you have an address of the default gateway and the path is not there, you know it's layer two or a layer one. You know it's gonna be something below that portion. The reason that is because it could be wiring or it could be tied to the switching environment. So it helps narrow it down. Test services, Telnet or SSH or FTP, that will verify basic transport connectivity. Look at ACLs if you have access to the equipment. Maybe an ACL is blocking one part of what you're trying to accomplish. Ping doesn't work because we've blocked ping. All right, well, try HTTP-based traffic. Lastly, verify DNS. You always want to make sure that you have basic connectivity through both directed IP addresses and DNS lookups. We have a few labs in troubleshooting our network. And that is it for this chapter. We have another lab looking at troubleshooting. We have troubleshooting a challenge looking at documentation. And again, we looked at tools. We looked at processes. We looked at understanding the bottom up troubleshooting method. And that is all we had for this chapter. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.